During the last few years, we've been doing a series of interviews called Winning Team. We've been following the top coaches around the world, talking to them, asking them the same yeah. 10 questions and seeing what makes them tick, seeing what sets one coach apart from another. I've personally interviewed Rick Charlesworth twice during this period of time and asked him exactly the same questions on both occasions, first during 2010 and then two years later in 2012. Here's the two interviews put together. First, the question asked in 2012, together with the answer, and then we hear the 2010 answer following on. Enjoy. I'd just like to talk to you about your philosophy of the game, once again, with things that we talked about uh, two years ago now, I think, uh, originally, and just see if your responses have changed in that time, and if so, how they've changed. Um, so what would you say are the critical factors in creating a winning hockey team? Oh, you need good players. Um, they, they need to be uh, athletically gifted, they have, to have the skills, the technical capacity, of, and then they have to be able to cooperate and work together, you know, and they, you want them to have ambition. So I think, you know, those are the elements that, that, that you need. Uh, number one is you need very good players. Uh, and. Uh, um, you uh, so so uh, you you need talent and you need depth of talent, um, but uh, of course uh, if you don't have that, then you have to build those players, improve them, develop them, and continuously improve the group. So you need gifted players. I think you need real definition about how you go about uh, your task. Mm -hmm. They need uh, to understand exactly what their roles are, and and um, I think you also have to be true to uh, the culture. I mean, in Australia we play away, which is different to Korea, different to India, different to uh, Germany, and, 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 but it's, it, it suits our uh, way of playing. I think also what I try to do is, is to, uh, to fashion the way of playing to the gifts of the players rather than to get the players to uh, fit to a particular formula. And I think that is important. And then in the end, all of the important decisions and judgments that are made in the game are made by the players, so you have to spend your time preparing them to make those decisions and judgments, and that's a continuous iterative process that goes on and on. You, you try something, you review it, you, you improve it, you try it again, you, and, and that, that's a continuous process. Okay. Um, uh, in the modern game, how important is it to have a specialist drag flicker? Oh. Too important for my liking, probably, you know, 30, 40% of scoring, maybe more for some teams is, uh, comes from that. And so it gives a lot of emphasis to a very narrow skill. Um, and, um, you know, the corners are always problematic. The umpiring of them is almost impossible. Um, so uh, it's, it's an unfortunate part, but it's, it's important. We spend a lot of time on it. Um, and you hope that uh, you have quality there. It can be, it can be hard to win without it. Well, as long as the corners are as they are, then uh, it's, it's an important part of it. I'm sure you could still win without it. But we actually, uh, we actually have a range of people who can do that job, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the teams are trying to do so. If you have someone who's special in the group, then that uh, adds to uh, what you can do. Um, so it, it's an important part of it, but um, you uh, you have to balance that against the people who, who do that role being competent quality field players and that's always a balancing act that every coach is uh, dealing with. Yeah. I think the rule at the moment is, uh, is not good for hockey because it gives too much emphasis to a very narrow closed skill. Yeah. It would be better if we had a different sort of corner without the danger and all of the things that go along with the present corner. We're trying something different in Australia at the moment for our National Hockey League we'll see how that goes. Okay. Um, the selection process, and we're here in Cairns, you've literally just announced the team for the London Olympics. You've got this situation which coaches are bedeviled with uh, on a regular basis, which is how do you select one player over another player? Oh, <laughs> it's an iterative process. I think it takes time. Over the year, the performances are measured. We try to objectify that as much as possible. Then we look at how they fit in the group, the balance of the team, sorts of things that are in the emphasis, you know, you've got to have a corner battery, you've got to defend them, 
take and there's a whole range of things that go into it and in the end you find yourself uh, with a half a dozen very difficult ones uh, anyway and uh, we've, there are some players who are very very unlucky not to have uh, had a chance but um, at the moment we don't have uh, you know well, we're not allowed any more than 16 that's the, that's the dilemma We've got quite a few injuries at the moment, which bedevils our process even more. And uh, in the next few weeks, uh, hopefully they'll, they'll be settled or sorted out. And so there's still, still a fair opportunity for some people to get there that makes the, the group still competitive. Yeah, it certainly does. Well, I, I think you always are doing, in selection, you are doing a calculus, and the calculus is what are the benefits and what are the costs of this player, what yep. do they bring to the team, what things perhaps do the others bring, and you have to make that calculation. And uh, that's the case that always is, occurs with selection. But you also have to have a balanced team, and in the end, when it comes to selecting the last few players for your team, it's the balance of the group and their flexibility and the, all of the things that they offer that perhaps are different. Sometimes it's a set play skill that sets a player apart. Sometimes it's, a, it's the versatility that sets them apart. Sometimes they have a special quality that, that you think you need in the team. Um, and, and so uh, you are always doing those sorts of calculations. But in the end, maybe for the final one or two selections, then uh, versatility and flexibility are important factors too. Okay. So, um, I think it was two years ago now with the Adelaide Sharks. Your son, uh, you dropped him in the final of that particular occasion. Actually, he didn't make the cut again this time. Uh, I haven't seen him play a recent part, but that must be a very tough decision for you as being the father and the coach. Well, probably yeah. harder for him, perhaps, and for others, and for you in your situation. I think, yeah, I mean, for him, it's perhaps more difficult than for anybody else in the team. And maybe even the other players don't recognise how hard that would be. It's hard to put yourself in that situation, I suspect, but uh, he, he's bitterly disappointed. He, uh, he was somebody who was, uh, you know, in the last year was made a lot of improvements and, uh, and come up, but everything had to go right for him. He had a few uh, hiccups in, in April and May, and so that made it difficult. But there are half a dozen, uh, maybe not half a dozen, there are another group of players who missed out, you know, who, who were more unlucky than Jonathan. Yes. And, and so, uh, you know, they, uh, I, feel, I feel for them and I know uh, what, it, what it might mean for them. But still, as I said, uh, there's some openings and it's not until the 29th of July that the final group will be decided on. And so there's a fair bit of water running on the bridge here. Okay. Um, I, I don't suppose you have too much trouble motivating your player, but how do you go about motivating them? Well, I think you appeal to their ambition. Uh, they, they want to be a part of an outstanding team. They want to be um, they want to be champions, and and so uh, that can't be achieved unless they extend themselves to the limits. And, and, and you keep lifting the bar. It can't be achieved unless they can work cooperatively together. Without those two things, it won't happen. And, and I think you want your players to understand that. Uh, and playing for the team is, is, a, is as much as anything a moral issue. It's about doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason to help one another. And, and if and when they understand that, then I think you're in the way. I think uh, you treat them uh, as individuals, you give them feedback that is uh, specific to uh, their task. You, you always put in front of them. Uh, um, challenges that are important for them to, to uh, approach and reach that, that, that will stretch them and, and ask them to be better than they presently are. Um, those are important things. But you also uh, provide encouragement and lots of feedback. Okay. Okay, you've motivated them and uh, things aren't going well on occasion, as things don't. Now, how do you criticise a player? Well, I think uh, you, you have to have that pathway open. Every player receives criticism in a different way. Every player has their defences, if you like. Uh, but, you know, there needs to be an open dialogue. You need to go and say what you're thinking. Unless uh, you do that, unless they're receptive, then neither the team nor them nor the coaching staff can progress.
Okay. You have to be direct about that. You, you, there are expectations for the team, and the team has, uh, has expectations. So they, they let down their teammates, they have to understand that. They let down the group if they are able to fulfill their roles. Yep. You always hopefully give them a way of uh, improving, though, and uh, you, you said at the same time that you might be critical, you will set a, a, an agenda for improvement. Okay. And Australia is probably the best of the world in developing the all-round player, people who are no longer forwards or back that play across the lines. How do you develop the all-round player? I think you give emphasis to the fact that they have to be multi-skilled, they have to be flexible. It's no longer the case that I play on the left or the right or on just this or just that. Every player has to have uh, a range of skills that, that cover the, the spectrum. And by giving emphasis to that, by making that a criteria for selection, by playing them in different positions and expecting flexibility on the field, then over time you develop that. Expect the athletes to be able to be all-round players, and I think uh, you know, if you only listen to what Jose Brava has been saying to his uh, Indian players, how they have to be more undifferentiated, if you like, and we have been doing that now for a couple of decades in Australia, and we are looking increasingly for players who have flexibility and who are able to play all around the pitch. In the end, you need a, a pitch full of people like that. But you still need someone to be able to score the goal and somebody to be able to defend the goal. And so the, there is a different emphasis, but there is much more flexibility. The only way you do that is by actually asking them to do it, okay. putting them in those situations and actually having them experience it, practice it, learn it. Okay. Um, short corners. You review the attacking short corner during the game, um, which is obvious because the instructions are sent out onto the field. Do you review the defending short corner in real life time during the game? I think uh, there's a range of things that I don't uh, talk about publicly about how we run it during the game, but yep. certainly uh, right. we, we look very closely at what we do and we look closely at what our opponents do, and I think that's the, that's the, the way of every team and everyone has their own way of looking at it. You hope that what you're doing is realistic, accurate, and, and effective. Yeah. During the game? Of course you do and you know what the other team's likely to do and you're watching them and, and yeah, I suppose you use uh, you know, uh, intuitive logic what, what's happened in the past and yeah. maybe will repeat itself but you have to always be aware that teams can change and they have, uh, they have different strategies and depending on the situation in the game different things will, uh, will occur. But always the players are making judgments about uh, what they have seen, what, what has occurred and what is likely to occur. Sometimes that's best guess, you play the percentages, that's how you have to do it. But those corner situations are critical, that's why, um, for instance in this uh, in Aslan Shah tournament, it's critical that you have to get those umpiring decisions correct for those decisions for those uh, events because uh, and I think that's why the video replay is important in our game because those events are so critical there's so few of them you have to get them right. Okay. When a player receives a ball what's the first thing they should do? Well I think they should try and receive it um, in an open way to see what's ahead of them and uh, we always try to have that uh, and we want to uh, we want to have as the best vision that we can possibly have. If you've got people climbing all over, then sometimes you have to close yourself off and protect the wall and keep it secure. Um, and maybe then you give it to someone who's behind you if you can see it. Um, but I think you know, trying as much as possible to receive it in an open way so you can move quickly is, is the best. Yes. Uh, it happens before he receives the ball. Before he receives the ball, he has to know well, what the options are ahead of him. He has to know what is around him and what the situation of the game is and what the possibilities are. Then he has to make a calculation. You know, that I have a 100% pass there, which gives me no gain, or I have a, a 30 or 40% pass, which might give me a goal shot. Yeah, so he's making a calculation about where the ball should go, and depending on a whole range of factors in the game. Um, he, he has to decide what he'll do, but a lot of that happens before he receives the ball. When he receives the ball, yeah, we want him to be able to see where he's going. And uh, the capacity to receive the ball well is a critical part of the modern game. Yeah. Uh, at some point in time, an attacker has to take on a defender. Somewhere along the line, he's going to have to penetrate the D and create some sort of an opportunity. 
do you have a rule away about when an attacker should take on a defender or when they should take the ball off? What do you think? When he thinks the odds are in his favour, when he thinks that the chance is worth taking, when he thinks the risk is a calculated one that makes sense, when we think we can get a big reward, um, when we think the other team is vulnerable, there's a whole range of way, uh, circumstances in which we want to do that. And uh, I think that, uh, yeah, you're right, you don't create um, enough opportunities unless you have the willingness on some occasions to win those one on one contests. Yeah, we have general rules, yeah. but in the end, uh, at this level, these players, they have flexibility to. Uh, to uh, use their judgment, and as I said earlier, the, the most important things that happen in the game are the players making judgments and decisions, not not the coaches. Yeah. Okay. Final question. Okay. Uh, last question for this part of the interview, anyway. If you could change a rule in the game, what would it be, and why? Mm, it's hard. Now. I think there's two things. One to do is rather yeah. than one. Yeah, that's okay. Um, there's, uh, I, I think the corners, uh, as I said, are unhorrible and give too much emphasis to a very narrow skill. Um, we can make the game still interesting and have those moments of excitement to, with a power play just as effectively and, and I think I'd take a couple of players off the field uh, because the thing that makes the game and the Olympic Games will probably be like this, there'll be attritional matches, lots of defending and, and not many opportunities to score is that there's too many players on the field. Since we moved offside, everyone defends with 11, it's very crowded, there's not much space. And indeed, if they had not introduced by stealth, I think, the, the, the top or the, the hit on the reverse, which is now more or as, good, as many as half of the goals that are scored, yeah. then scoring would have been cut in half by the movement of the offside rule. So, uh, but for that change, uh, then we would see quite a different game. Oh, the, the penalty corner. Yeah. I, I would, I would, I would improve the penalty corner, make it, make it into a field play situation. Yeah. Um, with a, with a, it would still be called a penalty corner and have the same, um, uh, if you like, importance in the in the match. Yeah. Because it's a foul in the circle that that causes it, or a foul in the 25 that causes it. The other thing I would do is I I would bring back the long corner. Yeah. Stop teams pushing the ball over the back line. This is dumbed down defending and yeah. it's crazy. In this tournament we've had one corner given to the ball being deliberately pushed over the back line. Yeah. I think I've seen it 30 times. Yeah. And and so if you brought back a long corner where maybe there were five on the goal line and the ball had to go out to the 25, teams yeah. wouldn't knock the ball over the back line anymore. And, and that would be better for the game. Yeah. For more news and information on hockey events around the world, uh, log on to www.sportsmediagroup.com.au or visit our YouTube channel, sportsmediagroup.com.au.